Hi there, my name's Mark Payne. Uh, I race the Automatics A12 with the UK team here and we have a set of tips and tricks that we've been developing and we've done some rough videos on some of those things but I'm going to try and pull some of that together in a slightly more detailed way which I hope you will find uh, helpful. going to go through nine things together about the rear end of the car. Number one, we're going to talk about track width, uh, how to uh, set it correctly. Uh, number two, uh, in the UK there's probably three main uh, brands of tyre that we're using and I'm going to go through what those three main brands of tyre are, why we might want to use them and also uh, the fact that they it causes track offset errors that we want to make sure we've got right. Um, the third thing, I'll take you through how to find the exact center of the rear end of the car so you can make sure that not only is your track width right but you've also got the rear axle uh, centered on the car. Uh, number four we're going to look at uh, ride height and how we adjust ride height using uh, the screws and spacers on the uh, rear of the car here. Uh, number five you'll notice on uh, this car I'm using a Sagami uh, uh, spacer here and I'll take you through why I'm doing that and what I think to it. Uh, number six we'll talk about rear droop and how to set it. Uh, number seven we'll talk about the relationship between spur gear and pinion and how we get to the correct gear ratio that we want. Number eight I'm going to talk about some problems that you might encounter with motor binding if you don't uh, set the motor correctly in its position. Number nine I'll talk about the Automatics uh, A12 diff and why you might want to use that instead of the, the spool that comes with the kit. So first area, uh, rear track width. Now uh, in general we want the rear track to be as wide as possible. The limit on that is 172 millimeters. I'll generally set for slightly less than that. So on my car right now if I put Big Vern on uh, uh, then well, I'm at um, 170.7, uh, uh, basically 171. I know that that will fit in the box for scrutineering. I won't get any problems. In general, the narrower you take the track width, maybe you're getting into a little bit more rotation in the car and the car will have a little bit more steering and the wider you go the more stable the rear of the car will be. The track width is achieved uh, by using spacers uh, on both sides to set the exact width. On the non-motor side uh, you will always have three millimeters more of spacer than you have on on this side. So there's a, a quick rule. Whatever you set, it's going to be three mil more on the non-motor side. In the UK, uh, we're racing on uh, Lindau carpet types. We don't really do much high grip ETS type carpet, and we're running with a control additive, which is uh, a spider blue. So we have medium or medium low grip. Certainly at a national meeting, that will turn into medium, medium high grip, but we don't have the same really high grip that you might see in the US. Now really I would say there are three most popular tyres uh, that we're using in the UK and they would be what's on the car now which is uh, Ulti XM foam, uh, Schumacher contact foam which is the T foam and also the Hot Race Hagberg uh, is the other kind of tyre that we will uh, use in the UK. I will generally go between Hagbergs and XM. Hagbergs in general, it's a harder tyre. The way these are made, I believe the wheel is just slightly bigger than say an XM wheel. The actual wheel itself has got slightly more diameter in it and the foam is stretched over. So it ends up being slightly harder, but by fact that the foam is being stretched, it frees the car up a little bit. So if your car is smothered in grip, uh, the Hagberg tyre will bring a little bit more rotation into the car. It does sometimes make the car a little harder to drive, however, ultimately probably faster. The XM is a really good tyre, a really high quality tyre with a little bit more grip. So if you run XMs, it does calm the car down and it does smother it in grip. Now the Schumacher T-Foam and the XM have identical uh, spacing, their offset is the same. So if you set a rear axle for XM, it will be good for T-Foam. However, the Hagberg will naturally make a track width which is uh, wider. Uh, so uh, we have to actually use less spacers here. So again, XM or T-Foam, three and six, and uh, Hagbergs, uh, one and a half, 
four and a half. So obviously we also have to think about uh, front track width. Now remember, because there will be a slight amount of uh, uh, camber going on here, um, and I will general run around 0 0.75, one degree. I'm just looking to make the uh, the tires flat, but we'll cover that in a different session. I'm measuring down at the bottom of the tire, which will be the widest point. And if you look at that, that's uh, basically 168 millimeters. If you make it slightly narrower, it can bring a little bit more steering. If you uh, widen it slightly, it will make the car just a little bit less sensitive on the front end, maybe a little bit easier to drive. So uh, narrower, more aggressive front end, uh, wider, a little easier to drive. Now, <clears throat> in the case of the XM tire, and it also would apply to the, uh, the T-Foam, there's one, 0.5 of a millimeter shim one of these uh, one of these little guys here and that's an, a 0.5 millimeter shim it's part come, come they come in the kit and then to get the right spacing that uh, doesn't cause me any excess play I'll be running two of those on the outside so one on the inside two on the outside now, if we're talking about running the Hagberg tyre, uh, then there's two things going on. First of all, the spacing between the inner and outer bearing points on the Hagberg tyre are just slightly narrower, so I will use a total of four uh, shims. I will run all of those four shims on the outside of the tyre. So what I'm going to do here is just pop out the bearings and pop them into the Hagberg wheel. One of the things we really don't like about this wheel, the accuracy of the moulding is not great. And uh, uh, the problem we can have with that is that the outer bearing basically will, will fall out. Look, there you go. So the easiest thing is take a bit of gaffer, take a very small amount. There's only that much on the end of my finger that you can see there. And just pop that on. So half of it, is just on the outside and then half of it will be folded over and stick on the inside and then pop your bearing in and you'll find that that'll be a nice snug fit and then when you put that on the axle it will feel nice nice and secure you don't have any excess slop now you can probably see there that there's quite a lot of gap between uh, the uh, the kind of final surface of the axle uh, and the inner race so that's why we need to put the four spacers on is on there one two three four and that should be right for a Hagberg front wheel notice all the spacers are on the on the outside that's running nice and free there's no binding there and you'll notice that if you look at the position of the inner part of the tire relative to the steering ball that position there is pretty much identical to how it's set up with the XM. Can you see that? And that still will be, even though I'm running different tyres, obviously, if I take the Big Vern, that will be running at that, uh, that 167 and nearly, nearly uh, 168 track width. So by doing that, um, making sure that you've got no spaces on the inside and four half mil spaces on the outside, uh, you'll have the correct positioning of a Hagberg tire relative to uh, an XM tire. The first um, uh, gauge that I bought was the uh, this absolute thing, which I've had pretty much in my kit uh, ever since day one uh, but the problem with this is it won't go wide enough uh, I still like to have it because it fits nicely in my uh, tool case uh, but um, I'll put a link for you as also uh, but this is a 200 mil capable vernier um, uh, which I don't like I don't think it's as accurate and I didn't buy an expensive one so uh, this guy uh, is wide enough to measure uh, track width so uh, I call this one Big Vern it's it's all right you can take my word for it that you put uh, three mil more on the on the non-motor side than you do on the motor side in terms of shims you can find out yourself uh, what your centering is once you know a little a, a little secret if you like if you set your vernier to uh, 24 millimeters exactly 24 mil it's probably upside down for you but you can see that's 24 mil just to be sure I'll lock it off 
you'll find the halfway point by taking the motor side, so the motor side pod, if you then take that, and you can you see there, I've got a mark that I've made on my axle just by scratching it to begin with, just at that 24 millimeters. So this point here is 24 mil away from that as measured by the vernier. And then once I've made a light scratch, I've actually taken a scalpel and I've kind of scratched away the anodizing on here. So it's, it's, it's a very obvious mark. So now if I take a reference from the edge of the wheel and I make that touch this area here, let's crack on and then I compare it to the other way. Can you see that they're both exactly the same? So I know that my spacing is correct. Uh, and I've got the, the, not only have I got the right overall track width, but I've got it dead center in the uh, center of the axle. Now, another tip about the rear of the car, and uh, uh, hopefully you've not uh, changed this on your car, the bearing has got a, an O-ring that sits right over the, uh, the bearing rather than the bearing going into the axle tube with a hard metal to metal surface there's a degree of give there if you hit the boards rather than that load be basically used to destroy the bearing there's a certain amount of give which will save the bearing and I find that on this car I've really gone through very few bearings just nip that up a little bit more just so it's gripping I want that's too tight so I'm not feeling anything there so I'm just gonna twist and pull just a little bit still not enough twist and pull I can just feel a slight almost like a tap movement there so I know I'm not binding so now I know that I can tighten up you know with a reasonable degree you don't need to grunch it up but it just needs to be nipped up I mean if you grab that there's no way that's moving and also um, that should feel free and spin for at least 10 seconds and you know your bearings are in good shape uh, I always clean the bearings out in motor fluid um, you know worth brake cleaner get all of the uh, the heavyweight grease that the bearings get supplied with and then I just use an amount of uh, uh, lightweight oil uh, uh, to oil them up so they should spin like that and then maybe every other meeting I'll clean the bearings out uh, again in motor cleaner cleaner uh, or a brake cleaner and then I'll apply uh, fresh oil. Okay so number four we're going to talk about uh, setting uh, rear ride height. I'm going to go to the rear of the car and measure it just there and that rear ride height is about 3.4 uh, millimeters on my stepped uh, uh, ride height gauge 3.4 just won't go underneath now th that's a bit low really to be honest that could do with being uh, 0.25 higher I tend to avoid measuring in the center of the chassis you'll see there it's reading uh, 3.6 there it's nearly 3.8 um, the reason I don't really measure in the center of the chassis is that by putting side rail pressure in which we'll, we will talk about in a in another session we're basically bending the chassis and it will be slightly higher in the center than it will be at the rear so when we talk about rear ride height we really want to be measuring at the rear uh, of of the car so i hope you can see uh, that's where i'm measuring and then when i measure at the front really i'm measuring right at the front just underneath the servo and again, I'm at about 3.2 here. Uh, again, I wouldn't run it that low. I'd be running the car uh, slightly higher than that. So how do we achieve that kind of 3.7? I'll run at 3.7 millimeters. Here's one I prepared earlier. The way I do it is I use a couple of um, button head standard screws. This is a standard screw. I've not ground it or shortened it in any way. So you'll have one in your kit of parts. This is 11 point six seven i'm going to call this a 12 mil screw okay so 12 mil of thread depth and then i use three spacers there's these are the three spacers there's one that's one mil which is a standard automatics one there's one that is at 0.5 of a mil which is a standard automatics one and i've got one which is 0.25 of a mil to be honest with you i can't even remember where that comes from uh, maybe that's in the kit uh, I'd have to look up. Those three spaces are going to be somewhere on this screw. So we have our axle height, 
which is being caused by the diameter of the tyres and then uh, the more spaces you put in the more the ride height of the car is being dropped below that so ultimately the maximum ride height you will achieve is when there's no spaces at all I don't take away the spaces I just put them the other side so that the reason for doing that is you're maintaining a consistent thread depth uh, that's going into the rear axle if you take spaces away then what you're doing is you're putting more and more thread into the rear axle and I'm binding now on the end of where that can thread into so for consistency keep all of the spacers on there then you know that you'll be able to make the adjustment without running out of thread depth what, what, what tie diameter we do we have here let's have a quick look that's a 41.5 basically would i run that in the uk yeah absolutely especially on reasonable grip um tire size wise i start at maybe 42 maybe 42.2 um no bigger than that i just don't think there's any point uh running a tires bigger than a 42 or 42.2 and then i will probably run them down to if the grip's up i will run them down to maybe 40.5 then in the uk i won't i won't use them any more than that because we don't have uh grip in the tracks uh if you if you went out with a tire which is you know i, I don't know a 40 a 40.4 40 and you do a run on that it's going to come back in the 39s and that's really you, you're going to run out of grip so the lower the grip is the more the car sliding and you get more tire wear in fact so i'll do i'll start the front set of 42 as well uh, uh in the uk again uh i'm not really using a lot of stagger between the front and the rear tire i actually like the stagger uh, maybe a 0.5 stagger but i find that on day one i'll run the same tire size and when i come to run them again on day two having done a run with them uh then uh, the stagger will start to come in so i tend to find that uh, when the grip's low i'll be using a slightly larger front tire than i I want to use maybe i like a 0.5 stagger between the uh, rear and the front tires but if you start that way you're going to end up with a one mil stagger uh, uh, by the time you get to using the tire the second and the third time and i'll be getting maybe four or five runs maximum out of those tires before they become one run specials or i might put them away for a really high grip uh, track day so yeah 42 is reasonable place to start i need to find 0.25 uh, more ride heights so let's just take the rear axle off okay watch out for how your shims are falling about all over the place and i was using the active shim as the one mil shim is i'm going to change these two over so that that can go away and not be used and now i've changed to a one mil spacer to a 0.75 mil spacer which will increase the ride height by that 0.25 that i'm looking for and I'm going to just knock those two guys out of the way. This is how I do it. Uh, your mileage might vary, but I pop that in there. Pop that on. So that's the right shim, shim set that I want. I kind of hold the thing up, offer up the axle, just wind it in loosely. There you go. The car's not going to fall apart now. I'm going to make the same arrangement on this pair. So pop the one on that's not active drop it through so the 0.75 set go on just hold that there turn the car up and wind that in no shims dropped out nip that up nip that up check your ride on it yep that's a 3.7 and on the other side, also a 3.7. So the fifth thing, what about this optional uh, Sagami spacer? So it, it sat between the motor pods. It's not, it's not sat on the axle, that wouldn't be possible to do. It's stiffening the gap between the, the motor pod and the offside pod. The pod is held parallel in position by these four screws. Uh, you'd think that that wouldn't move so that I found when I came first came to install it I couldn't fit it in and what had happened is the hits that you take on the axle even though they are cushioned if you like 
by the uh, uh, the O-rings that are in here, it had migrated the two uh, pod plates uh, together, um, and so I couldn't get the, couldn't get the spacer in. And uh, by loosening off and re-tightening, then I could get the spacer in, put the spacer in. Of course, that can't happen now because you can take a hit here and these two halves are solidly uh, are linked together. These are available from Japan and a bit, bit expensive to get over to the UK, but what we did for, as a team of guys is we decided which parts we wanted and we made one uh, order. And I'm using three Sagami parts on, on this car. One is this uh, rear axle stiffener. The I use an X-ray servo saver. Sagami make a really nice anodized aluminium servo saver plate which is highly accurate and uh, it's exactly the same dimensions so you use all the rest of the x-ray mechanics the springs and the the inner part the other the other part i use as well from sagami is uh, there's a carbon tray which is hard to see but if I, i'll show you it here just here can you see that my electronics isn't sitting on uh, the the normal part of the chassis here. Actually, as you can as you can see here, I've got another complete setup which is also mounted on that Sagami plate, and therefore, with two screws, I can change the whole of the electronics of the car. You know, when you're chasing problems sometimes, and you you just don't know oh, what what's wrong here. Is it the receiver? Is it the speedo that's messing up? I've got the ability to just bang a completely another set of spare spare electrics in so number six we're going to talk about uh, rear droop which is effectively the the amount that we're going to allow the center part of the chassis to rise under deacceleration okay so uh, this is in some way controlling weight transfer to the uh, front of the car so we we don't want a lot of droop here we do want some but we don't want too much now what's happening is the rise of the chassis it's being limited by this screw coming up and touching that bar so effectively the length of this is allowing uh, this to rise up and touch that and you can hear it you can hear that happen that's well over a millimeter and that's way too much and I've got the car set up for ride height I've got the car set up with the side rail pressure that I want and I've got too much droop there so pop it in I'll try half a turn feel it again that's still too much. I'm only looking for about half a millimeter. I'm not measuring this any other way than by feel. Maybe just slightly too much. And that's just about right now. You can just hear it tapping. And I can just feel half a millimeter of rise in the chassis. One mil to half a millimeter is fine. Any more than that is too much droop. Now, if you make any changes to side rail pressure or spring tension, uh, then you must uh, uh, check. What you don't want is where you've wound this screw in too far and now you're bouncing that screw continuously off of the bar. That's not a good setup. Okay, so uh, uh, section seven is, we're gonna be talking about the relationship between uh, spur and pinion. On a 12 scale car, uh, we're aware that every time we run, the uh, rear tires are changing in diameter. So what, what we're interested in is the overall gear is effectively expressed on a 12 scale car as millimeters per rev and that is really how far does the car go uh, with every revolution of the motor now a good target for a 13.5 motor time correctly uh, 42 43 maybe maximum uh, uh, degrees of timing uh, uh, we will be running maybe around 70 millimeters per rev the higher that number the higher you're geared as your tire size comes down your pinion size wants to go up and vice versa if you're running really big tires then you'll be using a smaller pinion on the automatics car with the limitations of moving the motor forwards and backwards if you take the number of tooth on the spur gear and add it to the number of teeth on the pinion these two numbers added together cannot exceed 120 so if this was uh, an 80 tooth spur then this could be maximum of 40 teeth. Now an 80 tooth spur for a 
13.5 motor is going to be too big. The ones I use are, uh, are Roche ones, actually, but they come from um, Xenon anyway. And I'll, I'm, I'll put a link in the notes, and also you'll see it up on the screen now, uh, the spurs that I'm using. So my standard spur size will be 76 teeth. So with a 76 tooth uh, spur gear, I'll be able to go up to a 44 tooth uh, uh, pinion, maybe a 73 rollout, 30, 73 millimeters per rev rollout will be achievable even with a 41 millimeter uh, tire size. So even if I'm running quite small tires, I'll still be able to get into the 73s. Now I, I really wouldn't get into the 73 mil per rev unless I was on a really, really big track. So that 76 tooth spur for me would be the right spur to be buying on a uh, on a 13.5 type uh, uh, spec motor. Right, section eight, uh, uh, some motor binding warnings. When you're using the higher ratios, maybe because your tire smart size has got smaller and you're having to use the biggest pinion you can use, your motor is going to be as far forward as it can go. And I want to give you a warning about that. The damper is actually binding on the motor. In fact, I don't have droop anymore. Do you remember that droop that I set? I'm not feeling it anymore. And the reason I can't feel it is because the motor has come forward and has bound on the damper and we no longer have freedom, in proper freedom in the movement of that chassis. Now you might think, why would that happen? And the main reason, unfortunately, is with the Trinity motor. It's a good motor and they're fast and it's what a lot of us use in the UK, but unfortunately the the motor housing is quite weak. When you take a crash, the momentum of the motor bends it forwards and down. And so really, you can probably see it here, the motor is tight at this end in that my ride height gauge is flat against the chassis. But at this end, look, can you see that the motor is hanging down below the level of the chassis and that's because the motor can that was once straight has actually been bent in that direction and that's that's encouraging this touching of the motor against here so um, what can we do about that well you know it's very hard to bend these back some people I know have tried to do that and uh, other motors are available uh, the problem we've got from Trinity is that the um, the replacement motor which is the slot machine, isn't legal uh, with the BRCA because it was missing the poles. The poles should be labelled ABC and uh, unfortunately they've missed the B off and so that motor's not been allowed. Just watch out for that because it can cause you two problems. It can cause you the binding, but also it can you can fail ride height, not because you don't have enough ride height on the chassis, it's because the motor is sticking down below the level of the chassis. It's unlikely to touch down on the carpet, uh, but, but it's going to fail scrutineering. But be very careful with this forward screw here that, you, that you're using to secure the motor in because it's very close to the damper so the damper has this damper arm and if you're not careful that damper arm will bind on whatever screw that you use in that forward motor position so please be careful with that that's why i use a standard dome head screw i don't use any washers behind it i let it sit as tight in so that it's 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 down lower than the surface level of the pod plate and then it can't bind when the motor's forward so watch out for that as well item nine the uh, automatics gear diff okay so uh, they make the most beautiful uh, gear diff it's probably the lightest one you can get on the market it's the strongest it's certainly the most um, uh, robust a direct replacement uh, in for the spool which comes in the kit so uh, uh, I've got a couple of these when would I use them the answer is never uh, uh, I thought they'd be great and they are great and they are especially great uh, I would say on low grip tracks. So on a low grip track, I think, uh, maybe at club level, they're probably faster, but they're only really faster for round one. By round two at club level, 
uh, you're probably thinking about putting the spool in, and you're certainly putting it in in round three. At a national, really, we 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 reach a club level uh, grip probably by about halfway through round one. So the reality is, the spool is generally always going to be quicker, and I wish it wasn't uh, because the, I think the cars are nicer to drive with diffs. But in general, the spool is going to be quicker. Now this this one here, I'll have five k in that. So I put five k. Uh, uh, silicon oil in it and uh, uh, it's great uh, and I would suggest try one but if I was given my choice again I maybe would only buy one of them I certainly wouldn't have bought two the reason I have two is I have different levels of oil in them but the reality is I never get them out of the box now one thing to be careful of if you are using uh, the uh, diff there are 2.5 mil uh, screw they're not they're not a three mil screw so watch out for that and you have to be really careful with the length of them. I've ground them all to be 4.18 mil on the thread depth. And the reason for that is if you're not careful, what will happen, can you see as it goes in, what we don't want it to be doing is coming out the other side. Uh, and if you see there, you should just be able to see it's flush with the plate that it's going into. And we don't want it to be coming out the other side because if it does that, it will bind on the uh, on the case of the gear diff. This, this boss is threaded all the way up, so it's a very secure uh, fitting. So just be careful of that uh, thread depth. So one final rear end tip uh, would be about the screws that you're using uh, for attaching wheels. These are the standard kit screws. Let's just have one of these out. There's no way that if you're using a Hagberg uh, wheel that that's going to be deep enough because the thickness of the material means that it's not going to be threading in uh, to your uh, wheel boss. So in this situation, I use an automatics part, which is an aluminium screw, which is a lot longer. You'll see the difference in those two things there's virtually nothing sticking out so it's perfect length this is the sb3x7al if you want the part number but i'll put that up uh that you get a set of six they're horribly expensive so don't lose any so I've gone through nine, ten tips uh, on the rear end of the automatics car. If you, if you feel this has been helpful, please leave me a comment. And also in the comments, please say what you would like me to go through uh, next. Uh, this isn't just me speaking here. I'm using uh, the information from the whole of the UK team, which contains drivers that are much faster than I am. But uh, as a retired person, I've got a bit more time to make videos. So what I'm expressing here is on behalf of the whole UK team to try and support uh, drivers in the UK and all around Europe. Uh, so feel free to ask me any questions uh, down in the comments and maybe I can cover that for you off in a separate video. Uh, keep looking out because I'll do some more videos as we go move forward and I look forward to seeing you soon.